Distributed security in a national context. How can citizens' ability to control their integrity online be preserved in relation to businesses and states? I'm very happy to be there. Uh, my name is Bertrand Lachapelle. I am the director of a project called Internet and Jurisdiction uh, that relatively fits with this, with this topic. Uh, we have panelists here that I will uh, introduce. Tunjami Tjatovic, who is the um, representative for the freedom of expression, uh, freedom of the media for, sorry, from the OSC. Uh, Lin Santamu, who is president and CEO of the Internet Society. Uh, Eric King, who is the head of research of Privacy International. Uh, Matt Carroll, who is the public policy manager at Facebook. And Ron Divert from Citizen Lab. The interesting thing on the topic that we're addressing is that it relates basically to the relationship between or the interaction between the governments, including law enforcement agencies and uh, commercial operators. It can be ISPs, it can be uh, DNS operators, or it can be uh, major platforms. And this relates to requests that can uh, be for content takedown, access to privacy data, or uh, account deactivation. As the issue has been addressed um, at length in the previous session, we're not talking that much about surveillance. We're talking about the interaction that takes the form of an explicit, uh, an explicit request. And the interesting element is that all the actors who are on the, uh, on the panel are basically taking a, an approach that is from the global perspective and the preservation of the uh, uh, fundamental value of the cross-border nature of the Internet. And the issue we're addressing is about the tension between the uh, cross-border nature of this internet and the patchwork of national laws that are existing and are sometimes conflicting and uh, opposed one to, to the other. So I would like to, to divide the, um, the session basically in three uh, buckets. The first one is to do uh, a general <coughs> framing of the topic. There's a, a glitch in there. Is that okay? I think I think it's going up and down, and I want to, to keep it. Okay, I keep I keep that for the moment. So the first bucket is basically doing a, a relatively general framing of the issue. And apologies for those I'm turning my back to. Uh, a general framing of the issue, and then in the second part, try to get into a little bit more deep dive of the concrete experiences and the way things are handled on a daily basis. And then to move, uh, if we have time enough, which I think we will, um, towards possible ways forward, and particularly how to handle the issue of uh, process in those interactions, fair process, and things like that. Um, before we start, I'd like just to make a comment for people who follow us. Uh, in the live stream or online, we are going to tweet. I would encourage you to not only retweet things, but also retweet things that are related to expressions or comments that triggered a reaction in you, that you felt were either good formulations for the topic or are subject to further discussion and to feed the back to the uh, curators who are here so that we can have a feedback loop to deepen some of the topics or just to highlight some elements that really were considered as a good uh, presentation of the issue. So my first question will be uh, to, to, to Lynn in this uh, uh, first element of the general issue framing. As the president and CEO of ISOC, uh, for those who don't know ISOC uh, enough, it's also the home of the Internet Engineering Task Force, or the support of the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is developing the standards for the Internet. You're particularly attached to this cross-border nature and capacity of access. How do you see, from a political perspective in a certain way, the tension between the cross-border Internet and the national uh, legislations? Well, I mean, I think you've framed 
<laughs> the tension quite well. Um, you know, m nations operate on a principle of sovereignty. The internet doesn't know borders. Um, so there is a tension between that transnational component. Um, I think was said in some of the earlier panels this morning, at, at one level, a lot of these problems are not that new. Mm -hmm. um, and we ought to be looking for solutions that operate, have operated for you know, many, many hundreds of years that really do rely on established judiciary reviews, mm -hmm. rule of law, and ensure that when we look at some of these areas that we just work quite thoughtfully and quite carefully to pull them apart. There is a great tendency to conflate a lot of issues. Leslie mm -hmm. said this morning on the panel, yeah. cybersecurity, and there was a definition, I suppose you could pull apart security, you could pull about cyber, and you could in fact pull apart cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to be really thoughtful about the definition of whatever area we're trying to address. At one level, be as narrow as we can about defining what the issue is that we're trying to address, and then working in um, a process that actually invites all stakeholders. And that's important because, because of some of the, the lack of borders in this issue. It's also important that we bring the best minds. And at the end of the day, the internet doesn't know any borders. We say it's user-centric. Um, everything we all do should keep the user in mind at its, at its core. When we look at policy, when we look at legislation, um, really understand the impacts at a user level. Would it be fair to say that the... Uh the number of cross-border interactions are dramatically increased and that it is harder for governments to handle in that regard? Oh, I'm, I'm sure they've increased. I mean, the internet has made everything <laughs> increase. It's just scaled, scaled tremendously. Um, at the same time, you know, it, it, it is a process of escalation and mm -hmm. it always has been um, between the good players and the bad players. And um, just as the internet has scaled a lot of these instances, so has the internet also facilitated um, both processes and individuals in addressing them. Um, there's a Council of Europe, there's a London Treaty, there are an awful mm. lot of um, both bodies and policy that actually has come to the fore even more so, and a lot of them are long-standing um, entities or long-standing forums that have really come to, to address those. So I think they're scaling and they're stepping up at the same time, the um, potential numbers of, of cross-border transgressions, if you want to use that phrase. Knowing that this is the, the characteristic nature of the Internet, if I ask you, Matt, um, platforms like Facebook are transnational spaces de facto. Your terms of service, some people qualify them as the law of the digital territory. How do you feel about this, this qualification? Is that something you're comfortable with? Well, so our terms are sort of explicitly not local law, but I think baked into our terms is a recognition that we have both our terms and then also at the same time you can't have a global service without respecting local law. So there are situations where um, we might, uh, for instance, uh, IP block certain content that is a, clearly a violation of local law but not a violation of our terms, and we see that as a necessary element of uh, being a global company. Um, I do think sort of more broadly, it is worth thinking about this as like a real, um, really important and fundamental challenge to platforms like ours. We see, I think, three main challenges. One is request for content removal. The second is request for user data. Mm -hmm. And then the third is governance regimes that enshrine one of the, one or both of the first two. Um, and so we're trying to do as much as we can um, to try to combat this trend toward, um, you know, increasing requests for user data, increasing requests for content removal, problematic governance regimes. Um, the announcement that Susan Morgan made this morning about us joining GNI is one of a set of things that we're doing, I think, to try uh, mm -hmm. to highlight government practices that constrain access to a free and open internet. There are a set of other things that we're trying to do as well. Um, one is trying to highlight organizations <coughs> and initiatives that shed a spotlight on these issues. Um, and I think another thing, which I think will be the topic of discussion tomorrow, and I think it's often overlooked actually, is what can you do to spur innovation in a way that actually helps to advance human rights outcomes? And so we're trying to think about creative things that we can do in that space as well. Um, I think the primary one is um, continuing the support and increasing our support for the Access uh, Human Rights Award, which is uh, probably many of you in the room know the organization Access. It's a phenomenal organization based in New York. Um, and they've undertaken a, uh, a, an award that funds um, different types of app development or use of platforms that um, 
that helps to advance human rights outcomes. And so that's something we're very proud to support. But today you are, you're in a situation you were mentioning of <coughs> having terms of service that ideally apply as generically as possible mm -hmm. to all your users mm -hmm. in an environment where those users, where they're located, are actually submitted to laws that are completely different and may be incompatible with your terms of service. How, how is that handled? Right, so I think it's, it's worth thinking about how it comes our way. So we don't mm -hmm. go searching for content that violates our terms. We don't go searching <laughs> for content that violates the law. We have a report system. Okay. which means that users have to click a report button um, and report that content to us as either in violation of the law or in violation of, of our terms. Um, so when it comes to us, we will then evaluate, does it in fact violate our terms? Mm -hmm. um, if it does, we will remove the content. Um, if, it, if it doesn't violate our terms, but we have a good faith belief that it's a violation of local law, then we will block access to that content just within that jurisdiction, leaving it up globally. Um, the idea being that within the jurisdiction, you have to be respectful of local law, but ideally, if you're trying to promote free speech, you take the, uh, the I guess, least aggressive, the least, uh, least aggressive option that you can take to in order to comply with local law. And making it only locally not accessible is GOIP filtering, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we'll come back to <laughs> all, all, those, uh, all those issues later. The Dunia... The OCE has um, addressed the issue of hate speech uh, probably more than many other uh, organizations, uh, international organizations. Europe is a very interesting case where you have countries that are all relatively uh, democratic, should we say, and <laughs> nonetheless they have very different regimes and different regulations regarding mm -hmm. hate speech, which sometimes conflict in the international level. How does the OSC and how do you personally see this problem evolving and how is it uh, present in your landscape? Well, first I would um, not really say that the OSC did more uh, in relation to hate speech than other international organizations. I think that Council of Europe and uh, many mm -hmm. others are more engaged uh, in this particular topic. Of course, it is a part of, of uh, um, our agenda and it is uh, also related to hate crimes. Mm -hmm. When it comes to hate speech and the mandate that I cover uh, as the representative on freedom of the media, uh, of course I face uh, problems uh, if you look at the countries that the OSC uh, region comprised of, from uh, the US, Canada to Europe, Central Asia, Russia, mm -hmm. um, Belarus, uh, Ukraine, and the difference, uh, uh, differences in the laws and legislation, not to mention First Amendment in the US and then um, hate speech laws that you have in most of European countries. Mm -hmm. um, the way I try to tackle it uh, is uh, that I look at it from more international perspective, international commitments. Um, I am personally against blocking and filtering um, for more speech, um, fighting uh, bad speech, uh, than for suppressing it. It's not an easy task, it's a very mm -hmm. um, um, complicated issue, uh, particularly in the part of the world that I come from, the Balkan, um, not to mention um, you know, the, the previous war um, mm -hmm. and the issues in relation to, to, to hate speech. But the OSC in, in general uh, promotes uh, and, and fosters comprehensive uh, security um, and freedom of expression is often a litmus test for mm -hmm. abuse of any other human rights uh, that uh, you see um, uh, it's present in, in, in certain countries. Um, I also have to say that uh, with the hate speech, um, I'm quite careful when I mm -hmm. see and when I hear the explanations from certain governments that they are doing um, some kind of you know, restrictions or they are planning to do some kind of restrictions in relation to hate speech or any other issues that we heard also this morning. Um, um, fighting uh, um, certain crimes, uh, protecting minors uh, and all these other issues. If you scratch these laws, if you look under the carpet, most of the time what you see is uh, that they are protecting um, their powers and um, um, many other things, but not really trying to protect society from mm. hate speech or any other issues. But the, the, sorry to interrupt you, mm. but the challenge is you have very different frameworks in countries that can be neighbors where something is criminal in this country and not in the other one. How does that work, particularly when it is about an interaction between people who are across borders? Because, let's be frank, <laughs> if it's a French person in France 
speaking in French on a French platform, I mean, there's no problem, it's the French load done. But if it is using a foreign platforms, interacting with somebody in another country, how does that work? Or why should that work? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a not that you formula. Have right now. <laughs> Probably will not be sitting here if we have a formula <laughs> how to solve these problems. Uh, but um, only by the end of the session. But what we have, <laughs> but what we have, all of us. I mean, all all countries, all international organizations. We have our international uh, agreements, uh -huh. uh, conventions, that all the countries uh, sign voluntarily. And uh, uh, many of the laws that uh, are used, uh, and I'm here not talking about bad and good guys, uh, as we heard this morning many times. I'm talking, you know, across the borders, uh, east mm -hmm, and west, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. south or north of Vienna, yeah. as we say it. Um, um, <laughs> those those uh, countries are not changing their laws that are um, outdated, traditional, old, not uh, answering a new uh, era, digital era. Um, and then there are you know, presenting to you this, uh, the laws and saying in our country is this and that. But then, you know, my question is, what have you done in order to comply with international uh, mm -hmm. conventions? And we, we heard this morning about this uh, wonderful development at the Human Rights Council and the Internet Freedom uh, Resolution, which I think is absolutely a great document. But what we all need to do now is to continue pushing the countries that voluntarily agreed to, 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 to say, you know, this is something that we will honor and this is something we will, you know, value as an important document to do this in their own countries and not to mm -hmm. continue saying, you know, we are different, we need more time and uh, we, we have different laws, our national security, our issues. So the OEC is a good platform because uh, we have this uh, sort of mechanism of blaming and shaming that is not used uh, so sort of uh, mutual um, control or mutual exactly uh, peer to peer observation, peer -to -peer. observation uh, observations, and I think we do not use it as much as we should. Uh, of course, no government likes to be criticized, but uh, exposing mm. the, the the problems and wrongdoings I think can help a lot. That's interesting because it's uh, in many in many cases, and you were mentioning the Council of Europe, who indeed is is doing a lot of things, and has the the Court of Human Rights, which is a complete judiciary. Um, uh, topped system. Uh, the naming and shaming and, and peer review is an element that is probably not enough um, used in, in our discussions and it's, it's worth highlighting. Um, Eric, I, I know that in, in, in many cases we had the, uh, the discussion on surveillance uh, this morning and I know that one of the topics that you really care about is the uh, controls on export of, of technologies for, for surveillance. And if you want to talk a little bit about that, you're, you're allowed. <laughs> but what we, <laughs> what my, my, my key question is, as somebody from, from Privacy International, when there are requests for access to privacy data, yeah. the amount of private data that has been collect that is not collected by, by um, companies for their natural activities, either collected or given by users voluntarily. The, this amount of data is what I like to call a treasure trove somewhere that is attracting a lot of appetite by a lot of, of actors. And if you are doing an inquiry, it's legitimate that you want to have access to as much data as possible. Does that mean that because the amount of data is much larger, there should be new rules, or do the normal rules um, still apply? Well, I think we've got a, a fundamental kind of starting point as a problem, which is that we rarely know what the rules are. I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if, if you look at um, the powers that the police have to enter a home in the United Kingdom, for example, there's clear case law on that. You understand the powers, and they're not bad, right? Nine times mm -hmm. out of ten, the person <coughs> gets notified. If, if you come into someone's house, the warrant will usually be presented to you at some point. Um, usually that's as they're kicking down the door or forcing you to open the door. Or even if it's afterwards, they, they usually end up having to leave something to notify you that that's mm. taken place. Procedure, like right. documented um, traceability. Exactly, and, and this, is, this is kind of well covered and, and it's, it's easily understood. Now, if you go into my flat, you're, you're not gonna find much interesting. You're gonna find some dirty laundry and some books that I haven't finished reading, <laughs> right? I mean, but if you look at information that companies hold on me that I, that I kind of the services that I use, you're going to find mm -hmm. a staggering amount of information. I mean, more than actually I can really comprehend. Mm -hmm. um, that you mean they know you better than you know yourself? 
Well, I th I'm not sure it's always 100% you know, reflective, but I mean, I think there would be certainly interesting things you could pull out of there. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is that what we don't have is, is decades worth of you know, clear le legal kind of guidance on how this, is being, how this law is being applied to these kinds of companies. Mm -hmm. In the United Kingdom, just to c take a really, really narrow example, there's about five or six different bits of legislation dating back 45 years that could potentially be being served against companies like Facebook um, or other telecommunications companies to allow them to get access to this information. Now, that's really problematic because it means that it's very, very difficult to be able to understand the standards that we want to be putting in place. Now, my understanding in, in relation to Facebook and, and kind of a number of other companies is that they voluntarily comply with kind of the, the bigger acts that we talk about. And again, I'm sorry to keep talking about the UK, but in the UK, that would be the Regulatory Investigative Powers Act. But there's a whole range of other laws that could be potentially being used to force mm. disclosure of information. And so in this instance, I think, you know, while we put a lot of pressure on, on companies here um, to act responsibly, I think that it would be nice to really hammer home against our governments to come clean on exactly what powers they think they have and how they're using them. Because there's really, it's really not clear. Um, is, there, is there, sorry to interrupt, is, is there a, a, a general um, agreement on the, on the panel on this notion that clarifying the modalities, the procedures, and the way the existing laws should be applied to access to those private data is a worthwhile objective? Is there a, a nod, generally? Not enough, but Not enough? it's a start. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to, to grasp a few things that, that can thread the discussion uh, uh, afterwards, so it's uh, any any comment. I, I think I think it's an incredibly compelling point. I mean, I think that it's in, I think that it is very important for citizens to be able to hold governments accountable and to force and to try to compel governments to change practices that are um, anti-privacy, anti-democratic, anti-user rights. And it, in order to do that, it has it's important that governments are clear about the procedures that they're using. Any well, yeah, I mean, the then. important thing about the, the fact that they show you a warrant, not is that there's traceability, but it's that they actually follow judiciary process to mm -hmm. actually get. And, and that's the critical point. So it's, it's things like that. It's things like transparency. Um, it's being public about when they will enter and <coughs> under what circumstance. Um, there's, you know, a, a number of different organizations, EFF, have a bunch of guidelines yeah, in terms absolutely. of... And I think those are all very useful, which is why my first response was, uh, that's certainly one point, but it's just not, not enough. Okay. Um, Ron, I want to, <coughs> to address the issue of unintended consequences of, of national decisions. Um, in the exercise of sovereignty, because we're basically talking about the exercise of sovereignty, yeah? in the exercise of sovereignty in an international environment that is connected the decision that is taken at the national level can have an impact across borders mm -hmm. and there's one of this example if you want to, to, to talk about it between uh, India and Oman mm -hmm. how to handle this transboundary impact of national decisions <clears throat> well that's an excellent question uh, the case you're referring to comes from <coughs> excuse me uh, a report that the citizen lab uh, helped produce where we found that in India uh, um, there was uh, uh, censorship going on around particular uh, uh, websites associated with filing. They call it filtering, but... Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, we found out one of our researchers in Oman was doing tests and, and found out, well, wait a minute, what, why are all these Bollywood sites being blocked in Oman that have nothing to do with Oman? It had to do with a, a peering arrangement between the ISPs. And I think that's... That's really an interesting area to explore because once, r frankly, that's a minor example of yeah. a much larger set it's of issues more mistake that, that has, has to do with um, the extent to which, you know, we do live in this global system of intercommunication and connection and, and yet the uh, sovereign state system is still very much with us, in fact, more than ever. Um, in closer to home, for me, I think, uh, an interesting study was recently commissioned by the Canadian Internet Registry Authority about mm -hmm. the number of internet exchange points in Canada. There are only two of them. And this has a, an effect on Canadian traffic, uh, you know, for economic reasons primarily, efficiency reasons. Our traffic is routed through the United States. And um, I often encourage students, you know, when I'm teaching, I say, 
Next time you send that email or uh, poke somebody on Facebook or whatnot, uh, it, it would be helpful if you could shrink yourself down and follow that tweet or that email message or that poke or whatever and see actually where it goes. And you might be surprised to find that there's this enormous physical infrastructure to cyberspace that we often lose sight of because everything's so instantaneous and fast and yet it is within the bowels, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you peel back the walls of the internet and you look down uh, beneath the surface, you see that, oh my God, this is where some really surprising things are going on, usually beneath the shadows. Um, there's been a long uh, history of collusion between intelligence services and uh, telecommunications carriers. And it's the, it's the um, untold story, if you will. Um, uh, even in settings like this, you very rarely hear about openly and frankly. It was, in fact, the session this morning to me was exceptional mm -hmm. precisely for the reason that you had somebody asking directly <coughs> the Foreign Minister of Sweden about a signals intelligence uh, mm -hmm. program. Um, these are the uh, agencies that I think, you know, for me the companies are, are caught in the crossfire here. Um, the fact that we've entrusted so much private data to the to third parties, to the private sector, is why we're in the situation they're in. And, and it is astonishing. I, I heard a statistic uh, the other day, someone correct me if I'm <coughs> wrong, that Apple announced they just surpassed uh, 50 billion downloads of apps. 50 billion. So each of those apps uh, mm -hmm. is not cleaner. just a data point about us, it is a vacuum cleaner of data points yeah. about us. And uh, most of us don't read the terms of service and so on. All of this data is ending up in third-party hands. And the easy targets are the Facebooks and Googles, but there are all these other, all mm. the application developers, the right. operators of the cell phone towers, the IXPs, the telecommunications companies. And when you factor in that governments are now uh, very aggressively ramping up cybersecurity um, and requiring uh, companies to police the internet on their behalf, it creates a very dangerous uh, combination of forces, especially as you move to countries uh, that um, don't have a tradition of oversight and, and good governance. Uh, I'll end with just one example. Uh, mm -hmm. I encourage everybody to look at India's Intermediaries Act, mm -hmm. which was passed in 2011. It's about this long, and it's the list of all the things that companies uh, have to abide by if they want to operate in India. Of course, it's not always enforced, right? But it could be, yeah. <laughs> and that's a scary <laughs> thing. And it, it includes things that, you know, I wish I could read it out right now because <laughs> it, I have an excerpt of it in my book. It's, it's astonishing to me, so I don't know how... Offensive to the state of India. Yeah, and neighbors, mm, right. and, you know, generally <laughs> anybody. <laughs> well, generally, generally speaking, and uh, well, uh, I'll ask in if there are any uh, comments in the, in the audience, uh, the notion of determination and interpretation of whatever document is there it can be the terms of service, it can be the... Uh, yeah the law in different countries is a, is a huge issue. Um, are there any comments before we uh, ask uh, the, uh, the curators? Any remarks? Question? This one there in the middle. Yeah, sir. Oh, thank you. My name is Amathias Mulumba from Uganda, and I work with the Uganda Media Development Foundation and in a project called Action for Transparency, uh, funded by CEDA and um, coordinated by Foyer Media Institute. But my, my query really uh, goes on to issues that have come to the fore in Uganda. Maybe I could, f let me first share this experience. We have just had one, one, of, our, uh, one of our media houses closed, in fact two, uh, as a result of a story that's being um, a run uh, relating to the son of the president becoming the next Uganda. And uh, they have used the very systems that is the justice to disclose, uh, to, to, to fight, sort of to um, um, ask the journalists to disclose their sources, which the House um, uh, denied uh, from, from the government, because attacking that very um, um, link between you as a media practitioner and your source um, sort of limits the trust that's built between you and even subsequent um, sources fearing to, 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 what? to give you information. Now that's what's happening now also on the, on the internet, that uh, governments now can use that, the very systems that we are talking about 
to force the, uh, the general the users to to disclose uh, kinds of information which they deem um, uh, of interest to them in the name of public interest. Mm. Now that's a challenge, and uh, to us, it's uh, an affront to our very very freedoms which we we, we think we should be enjoying over these uh, uh, given platforms. Now, um, also talked about um, um, uh, hate speech, but on many, in many, on many occasions within our media in Uganda, you find that the, 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 the very uh, term of hate speech is coming from people who are, uh, who are in government. And whereas we've asked media, uh, media houses, for instance, to, to, to have in their policy uh, uh, anything against hate speech, they abuse that every day. And it doesn't seem to, to have uh, any effect. So we're wondering how can we um, use uh, this for an, an international pressure to work with a regional uh, uh, governments within the developing world to share some of the best practices in order to rein in on, um, to, be, to, to get that within the regulation, but also in, in terms of enforcement. Because you get a challenge, really, if we are only having these small voices from actors like us to, to gain uh, internet freedom. It's a challenge. Maybe you could comment, but, but this, these are the kind of what we don't see um, coming up in this kind of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can, can I ask the, uh, the curators if there's any, any feedback or any um, words that have been picked up more uh, than others? Something that seems to be resonating quite much among the Twitterers is what Eric King said about the lack of clarity in leg legislation in, in the area of privacy, both regarding how companies uh, and how governments should, uh, should deal with these things. Okay, that's, we that's also true. have one specific question um, from Stefan Gens. Uh, are hate speech laws and FB terms of service really internet security issues? Aren't they like systematic threats? Wh what about systemic threats? Yeah. Well, some of these <laughs> He's right here. <laughs> 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 that's <a> good. <laughs> wow, that's magic. <laughs> <laughs> so as uh, very, for very the information, <laughs> the, the Twitterer has miraculously <laughs> emerged in the room. <laughs> 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 very, very briefly, what I mean is we discuss all these things, but they seem like sometimes human rights issues. Shouldn't we be more specific about which components of this affect security? I mean, are we talking about security of the individual? What if individuals use this to use the internet to plan a crime? What kind of mm -hmm. security? Where? I mean, we're, I think we're all sort of just cross discussing different kinds without trying to categorize. Because for me, systemic threats are important. Uh, security. When you say systemic threat, threats, so you mean to the system? The internet itself. Is okay. it, you know, yeah. So attacks via DOS that, 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 that dedicate denial of service attacks, mm. that kind of stuff. That to me seems like security issues mm. primarily. Then whether you know, hate speech or whether I post something to Facebook <coughs> is allowed or not seems like a secondary problem. Well, as or a matter of or fact, or anyway. it, mm, I don't know if it's secondary or primary, but it's the topic of this panel. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> as in terms of distinction, it's, it's, you're absolutely right, but it's mostly the interaction between, um, between uh, users, governments, and, and platforms, and how it is, how it is handled. Uh, we'll come back to that, actually, on one element, which is not systemic, but which is related to the impact on public order uh, issues, because some of the rules regarding hate speech or others are related to security in the physical world that can be triggered by, by, by speech. Um, I pick on the, the notion of clarity. Th this was clearly we can develop further uh, the kind of procedures that, that are being done. I also pick what Lynn was saying about the importance of judiciary protection or the notion that there is uh, not only notification but procedures at the national level that are embedded in the law to, to do this. And also the, uh, the expression that, that Ron has, has used, which is companies caught in the crossfire being requested basically to perform functions that are an extension of the uh, law enforcement in a, in a certain way. Just leaving this uh, at that, I'd like to get to the second part and deep dive uh, a little bit more into um, Matt, there, there's one, one question I would like to, to ask. You receive a takedown, I mean Facebook receives a takedown uh, request from law enforcement agency in country X. 
how do you know, how do you validate that this is indeed the law enforcement agency in country X? And two, how do you know exactly what the law is in country X and what are the procedures that they should have followed? So it's, it's a great question and there are a lot of different things that we do. We can work with outside counsel to make sure we have an understanding of what the local law is, for instance. Um, we also, in the last year, year and a half, have published both law enforcement guidelines on our site, which is a guide for law enforcement officials uh, to understand what our terms are, and also mm -hmm. have developed an online portal system uh, for law enforcement requests, which means that we only accept huh. requests from, um, from officials with a valid email address coming from a law enforcement agency. Um, not that any of those are perfect or foolproof, but there are, we do scrutinize requests very, very carefully and try to the extent that we're able to, to, un to make sure that we have a good faith belief that the uh, content that's alleged to violate local law does in fact violate local law. And there are lots of circumstances where we'll believe, we believe that it doesn't and we'll push back on law enforcement in those cases. So fundamentally, in terms of validation of who is making the request, you use the email address as an that, identifier. Uh, one, that's at one, first point. one tool. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's a silver bullet, but there's no, a lot of there are a lot of no uh, methods that we use to try to make sure that the request is in fact a valid one. How I, I'll, I'll give you a floor. one question though is being being sure that somebody is from a law enforcement agency in that country is a primary question. The secondary one being is the person at the right level of authority that is determined by the local law to be the person who should be making the request? Right, so, so, and so that, again, we scrutinize the request carefully and try to make those types, types of judgments. The ultimate question for us is whether we have a good faith belief that, it is, that the content in question is actually a violation of local law. Mm. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to come from uh, you know, the attorney, equivalent of an attorney general. Um, okay. The important thing for us to understand is whether it does in fact violate local law, and that's not just true in, I mean, that's true in a wide variety of different types of governments. It's true in India, it's true in Brazil, with content that we might all agree should be protected speech, electoral content, or religiously, in, in Brazil, or, elect, or um, religiously mm -hmm. sensitive content in India. It's also true for Holocaust content um, in places like Germany, for instance. Ron, you well, wanted to say something. I was going to ask a question, actually. There, there have been cases, uh, if my memory serves me correct, of takedowns happening not because of a lawful access request or a lawful request, but because of a perceived violation of Facebook's own terms of service mm -hmm. right. and instances where that process has actually been subverted by maybe not mm -hmm. even authorities, para-authorities, whatever, people who are working on behalf of the state in order to silence. So right. they, they take down content by subverting the process right. of your own terms of I'm service. I'm thrilled that you asked that because it is a, a prevalent rumor that is not true. So there mm, are, again, there are, there, are, um, there are two different processes. So users can report any content that they deem to be offensive or a violation of law or they believe to be a violation of our terms. That can range from look, this is child pornography mm -hmm. to, you know, I don't like that picture of myself. Right. Um, mm -hmm. We don't take down content because someone doesn't like a picture of themselves, mm -hmm. for instance. We remove content only when it violates our terms. So mm -hmm. the rumors that I think are very prevalent are that you know, the government of Egypt can hire um, a thousand people to sit in a room and push the report button. Mm -hmm. And if they push the report button a million times, then we automatically remove the content. Mm -hmm. and that's not true. We remove content that only when it violates our terms. So there was or, a case recently, though, yeah. when a, a <laughs> human rights group had their Facebook uh, content removed because they had images of what they perceived to be crimes against humanity occurring in Syria. Mm -hmm. And their uh, quite vocal yeah. criticism of Facebook was there was no process around that. Their content was removed. Facebook was the determiner of, right. of that without right. any engagement with the, the user. Right, so we are the determiner of content of, of our terms, right? So we determine when content mm -hmm. violates our terms. And I think <laughs> the issue that you raised is actually one that we've been wrestling with in a fairly, like, deep and intense way within, mm -hmm. the, within the company, which is how we treat graphic content. Mm -hmm. Because you can imagine that there is, um, there is content that it would be very difficult for certain users of Facebook, 14-year-old mm -hmm. users, 15-year-old users, 16-year-old users of Facebook to see. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are very legitimate expression mm -hmm. value or newsworthy value to people being able to share incredibly disturbing images of some of the events that are occurring in a place like Syria. So yeah. that's, a, that's an ongoing question <coughs> for us as a um, as a platform. I do think it's also worth reiterating that the thing that is informing all of the decisions that we make is our mission to make the world more open and connected. And that sounds, I think, 
I don't know, if I were sitting in the audience and I heard someone say that uh, from a company, I'd probably roll my eyes. Um, but I think from the view inside the company, it really does inform how we approach lots of different types of decision about lots of different types of content. And so with a question about graphic content in a place mm -hmm. like Syria, for instance, I think there are legitimate arguments on either side, one being that if you want to create a community where people feel comfortable sharing, that's about openness and connection, some of the images that like a 15-year-old might confront as a result of that kind of sharing actually make it a less open space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a, also a strong argument on the other side, which is that that's precisely what openness and connection is all about, mm -hmm. is being able to share those kinds of photos. Yeah. This is triggering a very interesting uh, request for comments. So I have one, two, three, four, five. If, if you can contribute quickly so that we can move to a, a, next, a next point. Um, let's go first to you, yes. the, for the audience, and then I come back to sure. you both. Yeah, hello. My name is Malu Mangahas from the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. I just wanted to ask, have you ever regretted taking action on a government request to take down content? And I think a follow-up question to that exactly is it's very tricky when a government is repressive or when a government actually violates human rights of citizens, uh, you weigh very difficult options here between really taking the side of human rights and democracy or you know, just staying in business in that country, where more likely you have uh, a bottom line to protect, as was mentioned earlier. So what is the protocol for testing best interest reference for taking down content and protecting privacy? A final question is, do you tell the people <laughs> whose private content you share with government that government has made a request to open up their records? All really good questions. Yeah. Um, sorry. Do we, maybe, maybe we get to the questions uh, first and, and allow you to, to, to feedback on, on this. But I want to make one, one uh, general Actually, comment. Can I answer the week. first question? Just because okay, I'd go ahead. to answer the first question. Yeah. And I, I'm yeah, happy sorry, to answer no. the others as well, but <laughs> before we get, I, I'd love to, um, which is that we always regret it. I mean, we would love a world in which our terms are the terms that govern the use of Facebook everywhere. So any, <laughs> it, like if you're interested in making the world, this is why I think it's important to really think about how Facebook operates in terms of our mission. Our mission is to make the world more open and connected. If you believe in that, then the terms that you create are the minimal terms required to create an open and connected world. So by default, the default should be expression is okay. And there are some circumstances, again, you know, child pornography, um, certain other types of contents, bullying, per, uh, for instance, potentially, where you would think that to make the world more open, you actually have to remove that content. But we would love if our terms just governed <laughs> in any jurisdiction, the problem is that there I are bet. jurisdictions, and it's not just and, and it's not just um, you know it's not just Iran. It's you know we would we would be very happy to allow users in Germany to share a wide variety of content, even that's considered. I mean, e even like Holocaust-related content, you know, which we permit in the United States or permit outside of Germany. So, any time we are IP blocking content pursuant to local law and not a violation of our terms, I think is a failure of freedom of expression globally. Right. I think it's interesting to, to note the expression, we would love if our terms governed in all jurisdictions. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, right. It's I just, mean, it's I, just I not be, to I, be picky. I, I mean, th that, that would be easy to be taken out of context. I mean, no, I guess, no. You know, this what is I, why I pick it, because I'm, I don't want it to be, to be precisely picked out of context. Right. I mean, I mean my, what, I'm, what I'm saying is if there were no additional burdens on speech, that would be a good thing. Yeah. And so, right, so, so typically it is our terms plus local law. Uh, we would love if it were just, you know, only our terms. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the, this will, this will be difficult. Just to clarify, in many yeah. countries, press freedom is an under bridge. No law shall be passed, abridging freedom of speech and of the press. So technically, governments have no right to <laughs> request take down. I'd also like to very Robert. quickly say that while, while it, <laughs> I, I would certainly shudder at the idea that Facebook's terms of service yes. uh, would define the world, particularly on their privacy uh, issues. I think we all have <laughs> serious concerns and there's been, there's been violations time and time again and there are very real reasons why you don't get to do that as a company. Uh, Robert and Dunya. And sure, my name is Robert Garam with the, the Citizen Lab and I just wanted to, to pick on, on, on a couple of things that, that Matt commented and you know it's great to hear you say that you know you're the arbiter but the issue is that Facebook's not the only platform. There's a variety of different companies that have different rules. And um, for expression, for other things, the government and the courts are the final arbiters. There's uh, independent review. 
And so uh, what I'm struck is that um, for users who are trying to navigate this and trying to appeal it, um, you know, I, I'm, you know, maybe it's the, the, the Canadian me is that there should, you know, what do you think of having uh, an independent appeal mechanism or an overview um, that people, you know, that could be evaluated because, the U, you know, um, Facebook's in the U.S. It's subject to U.S. norms. They vary from place to place. I know, Dunya, and where you work, you kind of take a look at what happens, uh, you know, across Europe. So I think that, for me, it's not good enough to have a c company say it's our values. In fact, they're well-established values. There's mechanisms that should be used. And so I, the, the question, I guess, that's kind of my, my, my comment, I guess, is in joining the GNI, uh, are your processes um, going to be um, shared with other companies? Are people going to adopt Facebook's approach? Or is Facebook perhaps going to adopt some other standards that the GNI network develops to, to, to improve it? So are you going to learn from the network and improve that? Because uh, you know, I know YouTube uh, with Wael Abbas had all issues with images. They took them down, and then they put them back up again. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, how um, Facebook's going to do that, and if you would be open to an independent review of your takedown request. Yeah, I mean, I think I I hope in joining. Sorry. No, 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 no. I, I was going to say I hope in joining GNI that there's a lot for us to learn. I mean, that's one of the main purposes of of joining is to be part of the learning community that they have. Um, I think the point about independent review is a, is, a, is a perfectly good one. I think that there's more we can do in terms of appeal of different decisions we make with respect to That's our terms. And I should also <laughs> clarify, I think that my, I, I, I'm not saying that we should be um, the sole arbiter of all content mm -hmm. on Facebook. I'm saying that in terms of making decisions about whether something violates our terms, those are decisions that we, at least to date, have made. Certainly though, I mean, we, like I have been saying, we do respect local law and so we, um, you know, there are other jurisdictions that can start going. I think the word, the word you used earlier, which was with grappling with those tensions, is, mm -hmm. is as telling as the other thing. Dunya, you wanted to say something? In a way, I see that we are discussing here only one part of the coin, okay. one side of the coin. Um, it's, you know, the issue of companies and transparency reports. I mean, the, the way I do my work is, uh, of course, I do follow what uh, Facebook is doing. Uh, I, I cooperate with them, with Google, with uh, GNI, and all other um, organizations. And I completely agree with what uh, Robert said that it should follow um, the rule of law, certain process, appeal process, and all of it. But what do you do if the government doesn't ask you anything and mm -hmm. they just simply do it themselves? Okay. Um, I recently dealt with a country. I'm not going to name it today, mm -hmm. uh, that blocked Facebook and YouTube. Um, bottom line was, uh, you know, and the, the real reason uh, was that the president didn't like certain content criticizing. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, simple as that. Um, no uh, any kind of uh, other infrastructure, but uh, the government controlled infrastructure, telecommunication infrastructure, and it was blocked for seven days, unblocked. Uh, we made a statement, um, I, I had to talk to the government, um, I even visited the country, um, and then they um, returned, Facebook and YouTube, and then they blocked it again. And it's happening all the time. So they mm. even do not ask anything, they just do it. And that's why, you know, for, for me it sounds quite scary when I hear, you know, we will comply with the local laws. You know, complying with the local laws sometimes is, you know, no, a <coughs> double-edged sword. It depends, you know, the kind of the country, you know, the region, and the way these things are um, seen in certain parts of the world. But, uh, you know, taking down by the companies, of course, is important, but we also need to look at this other side and to see how this is affecting um, civil society, bloggers, um, you know, social media activists that simply, um, you know, are arrested uh, without any context to any company or any international organizations in the name of national security. Do you think that the, uh, the notion of proportionality and, and granularity of actions is sufficiently pushed forward and how could it be pushed more? Yes, it is, but it all depends, you know, again, you know, if we are talking uh, about the 
so-called old democracies or new emerging ones or the countries mm. with a totally controlled regime. So those, you know, all, all these uh, uh, issues that are so important in any democratic countries that should work, uh, rule of law, appeal process, procedures, simply cannot be used in, in the discussions uh, in certain countries that uh, this is absolutely not uh, <coughs> and will not be for a long time part of a discussion at all. I understand. Eric, you wanted to... To say something as well. No, I just wanted to say earlier, I mean, in, in keeping with Facebook's mission to make the world a more open place, mm. why haven't you published a transparency report? I think that that really would assist in, in that mission and also kind of fits nicely with what you were saying earlier about how it would be great to have better clarity on the mm -hmm. kind of laws that you guys get presented with. Yeah, I think, I think it's a really fair question. Um, it, uh, transparency reports are something we're, I mean, we've been thinking about for a long time. Obviously, it's really useful to see Google, Google's experience, Twitter's experience, and now Microsoft. Um, it's, it's an ongoing conversation within the company. I mean, I think the question that we constantly ask is, again, given the issues that we're confronting, which is requests for content removal, requests for user data, governance regimes that, um, that entrench the two, is that the most useful way to do it? And I think that's a question that's, um, is, is that the most useful way to highlight um, to highlight those issues? I think that's an open question, but it's something that we're actively considering. Can I just quickly ask, what would be a more useful way? Um, well, so I guess I mean, so I guess I would ask back to you. So you know, I I have always tried to understand exactly what the value is of quantitative data. Like, what is the value that you get in understanding? What what is the value that you get in knowing that there are fifty requests versus a hundred requests versus a thousand requests? Um, a huge yeah. amount, actually. Yeah, yeah, I, an I, absolutely I would, massive amount. I, I would say it's an extraordinary development. Google's transparency report set a standard. <clears throat> For me, the surprising thing, actually, it was counterintuitive. I expected the transparency reports to show that all of the stereotypical nasty regimes are making all of these requests <laughs> when it turns out that right. the vast majority of the takedowns and requests come from liberal democracies. And in one egregious case, in my own country, uh, not even the uh, lawful uh, access people, the law enforcement people made this request. It was Passport Canada asking that a video, a YouTube video of someone urinating on their passport be <laughs> taken down by Google. And Google actually described this case because it's such an egregious example of one of the ones they said no to. Um, so I, I think I agree with Eric completely. These are um, important steps that I think are required of you, frankly. You're <coughs> a company now that has over a billion users. Mm. That's more than just another product or service. It's mm -hmm. become uh, the, the public space for a lot of people. It goes beyond just a commercial product. You have a public responsibility, I would say, to be much more transparent about the number of uh, requests that are coming to you from law enforcement around the world. And I, you know, uh, I don't want to just pick on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Why not telecommunications companies? Mm -hmm. uh, this is the big exactly. thing. Uh, you know. That being that being said, Matt, and before I, I, I give the, the floor to, to Lynn, and if there are other comments, they're welcome. Um, Matt has an interesting remark regarding quantitative versus <coughs> qualitative. In the absence of, of common uh, frameworks of what type of data and how do you report, uh, it's difficult to make the comparisons, and it's true that in some cases, you may have hidden actions that are not reported because they didn't go through the appropriate channels, and actually the ones that go through the appropriate channels are being reported. But the question of the, the validity and the useful, or what I like, is the requirement. Sorry? It's better than nothing. What's I think that's a point. Lynn, you so want to say something? And I'm not piling on Facebook. No, 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 I'm really not. I really want to move, there's a common, a I, I really move the, the discussion up to a principal level. Uh -huh. I mean, if your mission is open and connected and the internet is about openness and access and user-centric, it's about making that data available so that others can determine whether or not there's use or value in it, so that others can build upon it, so that others can innovate, so that others can learn and understand from it. Not that any one of us, company, you know, uh, NGO, should make that determination of what the rest of the world, all the rest of the seven plus billion people might find useful. So basically so you're talking also in a sort of open data uh, approach that people can dig on this aggregated data and draw some lessons. And the user-centric notion uh -huh. you know, that we is at the heart of the internet. Fair, fair point. Any, any comment either from the creators or in, in yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Thomas. No, there's, a, there's a mic behind. 
and we'll move to. Thank you. I'm Thomas Heinutzi from Austria, from Foreign Affairs. Um, until now, in our discussion, we took uh, national law as something absolute, that's plain truth. But of course, we know national law sometimes is not in conformity with international law. <laughs> and uh, in many countries, thanks God, not in all, there are legal proceedings. So you can appeal to a decision that something has to be taken off and you can make the way through all instances. And if you're still <coughs> dissatisfied, for example, in Europe, you could turn to the European mm. Court of Human Rights. Uh, so my question would be for the individual. It's not very easy. It's a lengthy, costly, you need a lawyer and so on procedure. Could a company like Facebook, when you come to your own judgment that this request by national law in country X is not in conformity with your rules, it's not justified that you would support your client in taking the case further on? Thank you. As a, as a matter of fact, in that, in that question, there is an excellent um, work by Lily Edwards, who is a, um, a researcher who has studied the case of Twitter. And the, the challenge is that the Twitter user cannot be um, part of, sorry, that Twitter cannot be part of a, of a lawsuit uh, related to a defamatory uh, element because they are not concerned with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the tweet itself. There's an interesting case I can, I can share the... Uh, the element. So the notion that companies would be part of um, an action against the sort of inconstitutionality or incompatibility of a national law with an international. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not clear about the utility of that. Like, I would think that that would be an area where like civil society would much be would be much better positioned to like join a lawsuit and and, uh, and you know be part of litigation on a particular issue like that. I, Questions of whether um, requests that we receive for user data are um, consistent with international law is, ac is actually part of the process that we use. That's in our terms. So um, you know that's public information. And we do do a lot of thinking about whether a request um, for that's user data thing. is consistent with international law. So it's certainly a, like an analysis that we go through. I'm not really sure. I, I, I don't know if we would actually join a lawsuit or not. I mean, the, the question then really actually ends up becoming about notification. You know, how, how can someone? defend themselves and protect their rights and challenge oh. an unlawful authority mm -hmm. if, if the company who's receiving right, the request so. doesn't notify the user. Right. And, and so right. That, no, that, it's, that's it's, the role that it's companies a, it's can a, clearly play. Yeah, it's a, really, it's a really difficult issue. I mean, in our terms, we reserve the right to notify users when we think it's appropriate. There's certainly other cases, I mean, kidnapping cases, for instance, where you mm -hmm. don't want to notify a user that there, there's sure. been a request for their information. So that's why we reserve the right um, to do it. How many times do you do it? I don't know the specific. I mean, mm -hmm. as, yeah. a, as a 10 times a year, 100 times a year, 50% yeah, I mean, of the time. It, again, mm -hmm. it's like something we reserve the right to do in cases where we think it's appropriate. Have you done it? Uh, yeah, I believe that we have, yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting question, the question of, of notification as part of the transparency and, and capacity for appeal. Lynn, you wanted to say, say yeah, something? Yeah, just, just quickly. I mean, a different angle to the same discussion um, is if we start looking at the responsibilities of intermediaries and quasi-voluntary actions. Yeah. Um, you can well imagine that in a lot of companies, they might be inclined to, to just do a little bit extra, do it a little bit early, just so that they don't get on the wrong side of the law. Sort of and chilling that's effect. A, that's a really chilling effect. It's a, it's a really slippery slope. So I think mm -hmm. we need to be careful when we start looking for um, kind of voluntary or quasi-voluntary mm. um, actions outside of judicial, proper judicial processes. Any, any comment, I come to you, any comment uh, on the creation, any word or expression that has been picked? Actually, it was interesting because it went a little bit deeper in the, uh, in, in, in the weeds, which is something that we tend to avoid. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, uh, we're getting a lot of criticism against Facebook and people wondering what are the, the terms exactly that allow them to take down support groups for... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, political activists and sex ed groups and such, and people seem to be unclear about what terms they are actually uh, violating. Okay, so, so it's, interpretation. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to answer it for every single absolutely. types of type of content that might violate our terms. I mean, I actually happen to think our terms are fairly clear. We have a couple of different versions of 
uh, not different versions of them, but like uh, different. We we have them in different forms so as to be read like readable for different audiences. So we have like a very legal version of our terms. We also have community standards. The idea being that that's something that's a little bit more accessible to all. I think that lays out our our policies pretty clearly. Can you change your terms of service without notifying users? Uh, no. No. Without specializing on, on, on Facebook in, in particular, the question of the elaboration of terms of service is becoming a very, a very challenging uh, yeah. issue for the companies themselves. I think to come back again on the grappling <coughs> element, they have taken such an importance now that uh, companies have difficulties changing them and they don't have the procedures to do them collaboratively. Um, to, to, to move maybe in the, um, in, in the way forward, uh, because we are half an hour before the, uh, the end, um, there have been a few, a few elements that you've <coughs> mentioned in the course of, uh, of this element, uh, of this discussion, sorry. There is a danger of what could be called a jurisdictional arms race, like every single country developing new legislation to handle those issues and conflicts of laws. There's the other tendency, which is the platform terms of service are a uniformization uh, tool in a certain way, or harmonization tool. There are two, there are two uh, elements. And the first one is how to insert more and more fair process mechanisms in all those procedures i.e. it goes to the notification of users. Can we deal a, a little bit deeper, for instance, on the notification thing? Because, for instance, the DMCA in, in the US, irrespective of its content, has a procedure for copyright infringement with notification. Can there be more clarity? Is that a way, uh, is that an interesting way forward? Yeah, from my perspective on notification, it's actually already clear. Companies, unless they're subject to the law in, the, in, in so if we take the UK, for example, mm. I don't mean to actually harp on Facebook on this one. I, I do mean kind of any other Let's pick company. another one. <laughs> Let's take Google, for example. It's all right. You, you, have, you have the Regulatory Investigative Powers Act, right? And so under that, um, the British government can make a request to a company like Google. Um, at that point, Google can either consider themselves bound or not. And my understanding is that most companies say that they are not bound. However, they do voluntarily comply. As a result, there is no problem with notifying the user. There is no tipping off. Mm. And they are absolutely allowed to do so. Now, of course, there are situations where it would be wrong to do so. But they are, they are a very, very small percentage. As, it's, as, it, as it kind of starts, um, my understanding, speaking to law enforcement officers in the United Kingdom, is that most requests for user data, as it applies, um, that they send to technology companies, are not pre the investigation. They usually, it's about providing specific bits of evidence they, that they know already exists that mm -hmm. they need to provide in court um, to actually take the prosecution forward. So there's rarely a time in which notification would be wrong. And even after that, in many circumstances, you can notify after either someone's been cleared or prosecuted. I still think that there's a notification requirement there that companies should be doing. But let me, let me try to spot a potential contradiction there. Because on the one hand, there is a notion that people resent the growing responsibility of companies making determinations on their own according to their terms of service and so on, because it's not their responsibility, it should be judiciary and so on. And on the other hand, if I understand correctly what you just said, there's this notion that because it is not a compliance issue that companies have to do it, they should actually make the determination on their own to notify or not notify. Isn't there a contradiction in there? Well, I think that there is already a compliance issue for them to notify. Within Europe, at least, we have the Data Protection Directive, okay. and that requires that companies notify whenever they transfer any data to a party which they were not authorized for. There's on, on private data, right? On private yeah. data. Now, not that, takedowns. Mm. Absolutely. And there's a question there about whether that could be extended to law enforcement. I mean, the, the, the starting point is always to tell people, if you, are, if you are processing their data, what you're doing with it. Mm -hmm. That's the default position here. And beyond the notification, would that go to um, uh, the question <coughs> of appeal that was mentioned, like capacity to respond, to get into a sort of dispute? 
procedure? Well, it, it provides the individual with, a, with, with knowledge that they understand uh -huh. what's, what's taking place. And I, I don't think that it should be on the companies to do this. I think that they should be firmly providing that to the users to allow them to make their own choices about what they want to do. And I think that this is a great way that companies can, can get themselves out of these you know, very tricky situations, and, and, but by giving it to users to allow mm -hmm. them to defend their rights. It doesn't get us out of tricky situations, but I, I mean, I think that what you're describing, which I think, it, I, I think there's significant need for, is more robust processes um, around digital due process. And I think what you describe in DMCA, for instance, um, is a process that works, um, you know, for private parties, but there isn't really a global process for um, for requests that come in from public 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 yeah. parties to private companies. One, um, one mechanism that we have found useful in some contexts, but I think really needs signif significant reform, is mutual legal assistance treaties, uh, which, are treaty, which are treaties between, um, uh, between two nations that govern how requests from, uh, for private data stored in one nation will be handled when another nation requests yep. it. Um, and that's a process that I think, from our perspective, would be very useful. So it's very useful for a US court, for instance, to be the arbiter of a request that we receive from the Indian government. <coughs> Um, and there's an opportunity in thinking about what mutual uh, MLATs should look like to really specify some of the various terms that mm -hmm. you know, Eric, Eric has mentioned. And I think there are probably a host of others that we might think of as very useful ways to govern, um, uh, to govern the process through which um, requests come through. Currently, the process is completely broken um, for a number of different reasons. One is that the treaties aren't standardized. Another is that um, the uh, entities that process them in the U.S. government tend to be very slow, and so it's actually not mm -hmm. at this point really a functional a functional process. So um, I'm very happy to mention the word MLATs because I was trying to find a, a hook to bring in in, <laughs> in the discussion, and I'd like to have the perception on on the pan among the panelists on the comment that the whether the MLAT system is functioning, whether it is scalable whether it is uh, appropriate for those issues in terms of time and, uh, and, and architecture, generally speaking? Well, I could take a crack at that. I think that um, one of the issues that certainly come up, just gen maybe not MLAT in particular, but generally law enforcement cooperation, is you can often reach a stumbling block or, or a roadblock when it comes to, okay, you know, we want information from, from this uh, jurisdiction, and in return, uh, you know, for with a country like, say, Russia or mm -hmm. another one, of these, well, okay, we will, we will agree to do that, but for us, what is considered a violation of local law may be a critic of the regime who's living in yeah. your jurisdiction. And that's what it can get to a certain part, but the reality of the world uh, kind of bites back in a hard way. Um, it's a goal, I think, towards which we should strive. Um, <coughs> in this discussion, though, I think it is remarkable that, you know, we, we are picking on Facebook is Matt is gracious enough to come on the panel and that's <laughs> something to to actually underscore because how many other companies out there wouldn't even bother coming to participate mm -hmm. in this because in fact not only are they including these requests and not telling anyone about it they're actually beginning to make money off of it because now it's a, a revenue model for them to actually engage in surveillance on behalf of the state that's what really concerns me mm -hmm. um, and again we're talking about companies at a lower level of the infrastructure of cyberspace that rarely are discussed in this context. I think there we need to lift the lid. Oh, okay, sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, you don't mean the platforms that are providing the service that are developing another it's activity? About the carriers. Okay. Interesting, uh, there, there was a nodding here. Dunya, you seem to be oh, yeah. nodding on that. I think, you know, Ron said at the very beginning, uh, you mentioned telecommunication sure. operators, and uh, uh, I think, you know, they should be uh, made, you know, more uh, accountable and scrutinized when it comes to this topic, because they are often, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. left aside, uh, 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 and they do play enormous uh, impact, and they have enormous impact in, so in they're, uh, the they're countries. Uh, just to give one example, if maybe if there's a representative of BlackBerry here, or maybe watching on Twitter, they could respond. <laughs> uh, BlackBerry is mm -hmm. used by millions of people around the world, and uh, for those of us who follow this space, a few years ago, the, an ultimatum yeah. was placed to BlackBerry in a number mm -hmm. of countries, UAE, India, Saudi Arabia, and so on. You either have to comply with local law, in that case, uh, providing access to their encrypted data streams, or you can't operate in this jurisdiction. Yeah. Last I heard, they're still operating in this jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know from BlackBerry, what was the resolution? Uh, when they're asked that question directly, of course, they don't, uh, they don't speak openly about it. In fact, 
The last time I saw they were asked about this publicly, the C former CEO, Mike Lazaridis, ripped off the microphone uh, in the interview, ended the interview, and mm -hmm. said, come on, guys, that's a national security issue. <laughs> Which is another of your companies in the crossfire uh, yes. type of thing. Yeah. Um, but just to, to, to stay on the MLATs for, for, one, uh, for one second, I mean, the OSCE, like uh, other organi international organizations, used to provide basically treaty frameworks or function under a treaty framework for confidence building in your, in your case. MLATs are traditional tools. It's mm. a bilateral arrangement. Uh, sometimes jokingly, I qualify MLATs as the switch network of the uh, international cooperation, just like you cannot multiply MLATs to the nth power and make a whole mesh of them. Hmm. What are the instruments that can replace? Because treaty drafting for those issues is, is not the solution. What is the cooperative method to bring people to update those MLATs, turn them into something that is for the 21st century? What's the replacement? Hmm. I mean, I don't, uh, the OSC, we, we call this uh, reaffirming um, and um, in a way rolling um, uh, of the commitments uh, um, into new era, into new digital mm. era. But unfortunately, this is not happening because anything that uh, we would see as a movement uh, within the organization needs consensus, and that's consensus from uh, 57 uh, participating states. So we, we have to be very realistic when we talk about any um, developments in this direction. And um, unfortunately, I have to disappoint you. <laughs> I cannot you know, reply to this because my mandate is quite uh, you know, unique and it's a bit different than any other international. It's the only international media watchdog uh, in the world. Um, and the power actually lies in, in uh, um, uh, calling um, the, the governments to comply with the commitments that they voluntarily agreed upon. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it sounds wonderful, uh, uh, it's happening if we live in the ideal world, but we don't, uh, so we have to be very realistic. And um, I also heard, you know, we were talking about notifications and due process and um, appeals. Uh, my work is uh, mainly related uh, to the countries where there is no notification, there mm -hmm. is no due process, there is no rule of law, uh, and there is no appeal process. And uh, um, people who are uh, engaging on platforms, uh, social media activists, journalists writing on Facebook, on Twitter, you know, using all these uh, uh, platforms uh, that are available, um, they get arrested uh, because of that. Uh, um, they, they are, you know, threatened, uh, family members are threatened, um, they also get beaten, harassed, and uh, this is the reality. As we speak, um, you know, th there are people um, interacting on, on social media networks and that's what they experience. So my work, uh, you know, is very, very, um, if I can say, you know, simple and, and basic and uh, I do not uh, engage in, um, you know, the, the the talks with the governments in order how to they can change uh, certain um, you know rules or uh, the way they interact with private companies. But uh, what I try is you know to change sometimes you know small things and get someone out of prison uh, because you know that person posts something on a Facebook and it's put in prison because of that. But to pick uh, just one second on the word you used regarding consensus, isn't that something that is plaguing? most of the intergovernmental discussions at the moment on these issues. Because if you want to have a large enough group of governments, it doesn't work because of the consensus. And if you have only a few of them, then the system doesn't apply where it is needed. <laughs> is that a fair qualification? Mm. <coughs> ITU is a bit different. You know, you, you, they say they do everything based on the consensus, but they don't. <laughs> so. Uh, Lynn, do you have I, I was just going to comment on, on consensus because in internet circles, yep. that's such a I strong, was sure you were. A strong <laughs> word. But, but consensus doesn't mean everybody agrees. Yeah. It simply means that you continue going until all reasonable objections have been addressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, there is a lot of sophistication in that, and a, and a lot of art. No, but it means until all reasonable, which is, which is an assessment, <laughs> objections have been addressed, which is another point of assessment. A lot of people are also afraid of consensus because they think it changes the point of decision making. Mm. And it needn't. It might, but it needn't. 
Um, so I think that's another one of those areas where I think we need to, to really slow down, think about what it means, what our processes look like, and not be quite so, um, quite so afraid of it. Particularly as you, you, I was mentioning earlier that you are the home of the IETF. The IETF works on an issue by issue basis. And uh, I was impressed by the comment that was made this morning by Leslie regarding uh, trying to distinguish the different subtopics. The issues that we've discussed here are relatively uh, identified. What is the best way to get the different stakeholders around, uh, around the table? Because at the moment there are businesses and, and civil society groups like the GNI uh, working together. There are some intergovernmental discussions on what do we do with, with those issues. But how to facilitate the interaction between the different actors? So, I mean, I think there's several different answers. Um, I think there are small efforts and there are big efforts. Mm. One could call the Internet Governance Forum a very large international effort. Um, you know, there are efforts at a national level, could be efforts at a, at a city level. Um, I think the first thing that people should do is not assume that because it's a legal issue, it ought to be dealt with only within a legal context or only with legal people around the table. So we need to be careful that we don't segment those issues and then think very thoughtfully around who either is impacted by the output of this discussion or who might have something to contribute to it and invite them in. And if you put that together with the consensus discussion and the fact that it needn't change the decision responsibility, um, then, I, then I think it's, it's, you know, it really is embracing this notion of lots of viewpoints around the table to both illustrate um, the issue, um, you know, try and identify perhaps some creative minds, but it also helps to then drive consensus and ultimately helps with its implementation or acceptance. Matt? I think it's just an area where I've been sh surprised at the balance between um, combative work and collaborative work. I think that there's a, there are a lot of reasons uh, for, for there to be combative work, and I understand them and appreciate them, and I think they're fair. Uh, but at the same time, I just think there's a lot of shared interest. And for people who think these questions are easy, I think they're not thinking particularly hard about them. Um, I think they're extraordinarily hard questions. I think the nature of digital due process, for instance, and like what that actually looks like, not in terms of 10 words that you could say in a speech, but yeah. at what it actually looks like in a granular way in terms yeah. of legislation all over the world. I think those are really hard questions and they require really big minds and they're not big minds that are in companies exclusively or not big minds that are in civil society exclusively. And so the fact that I think that these conversations yeah. tend overwhelmingly, I think, like on a 95% to 5% ratio or something, tend to be combative and not collaborative mm -hmm. really passes up a missed opportunity, particularly when <coughs> there's just so much shared interest in sharing and in, in shedding um, spot like you know shining the spotlight on really problematic practices that I think we can all agree are problematic. Which well, is why you guys should publish a transparency report. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th that's the contribution, right? Like that's how you that's how you get to do yeah, that. Yeah, I think then that's, we get I mean, to I, about so, your so again, I mean, I, we it can debate. You no, know, we can debate it for hours, and I think it's fair. And I think it's a, it's a mm -hmm. perfectly fair point. I think. I guess my my thought is that can't be the only item on the agenda. Right. No. So no. let's add other items to the agenda. We can continue to have the transparency report debate. Maybe we'll release one, maybe we won't, but there's just a lot of other stuff that you can do. And I think the thing that's been a little distressing for me is to see that the agenda feels like a fairly shallow one, and I think we should make it deeper. What would you add that uh, is not addressed today? So I, th I think there really is room for clarity around exactly what some of key legislation, like a best practices guide for legislation might look like that really balances between competing interests. So we can all talk about hate speech being a challenging concept and there are, mm. you know, there's a legitimate definition of hate speech and there's not a legitimate definition, but how do you actually accomplish that? So if India comes out with draft legislation or Brazil comes out with draft legislation, what are the criteria against what, which we measure that legislation and say, actually, this is a pretty reasonable way to balance competing interests around hate speech? I think that's something that would be a phenomenal contribution. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Actually, we are, um, given, given the time, we're almost engaging in the, in the closing uh, argument. So before we, we do this, uh, are there any questions or, or comments? Yes. Uh, you and you. All right. OK. Whatever order. And if, if the curation or if the remote participants want to make uh, comments, it's good. Yes, Go uh, Andy Purdy with Huawei. Just want to follow up the point about best practices for legislation. I think we've got to make a real effort to help advance the ball on best practices among internet service providers, where it's 
largely private sector norms of conduct, uh, accelerating the amount of information we share about what, what's done and what happens, trying to identify some partic particular strategic initiatives such as regarding botnets where different stakeholders like ISPs can make a contribution to help reduce some of the frequency impact and risk of malicious activity. Thank you. Interesting to broaden the agenda a little bit. Please. Just a quick question about uh, the risk of countries claiming extraterritorial, extraterritorial jurisdiction on content removal, like for example Twitter. What about super injunctions uh, in the UK deciding maybe that actually this content needs to be removed completely from Twitter, not just in the UK? But before uh, we all decide that extra jurisdiction, extraterritorial jurisdiction is a bad thing, what about using, for example, it's, in, it's illegal for Swedish and American companies to bribe abroad. How about uh, laws that make it illegal for blue coat and so on to export to countries that, uh, that violate human rights? Or for that matter, laws that would give companies like Huawei and ZTE the choice of selling to Iran or to Europe, but not both? <laughs> it's um, just like MLAT, <coughs> extraterritorial extension of sovereignty was a whole block in my um, preliminary uh, notes for, for this panel. And it's a very uh, huge issue. So, if in the closing remarks you want to make a point on on that, that would be that would be uh, that would be great. Um, any comment from the um, the creation? Um, uh, something that resonated a lot was uh, uh, Ron Divert's uh, comment on how the state surveillance can actually be a new revenue model for companies, sure. and if you could expand on that a little bit. Okay, maybe, maybe you can clarify a little bit, uh, Ron. Sure, so um, actually, not my research, somebody else's, Chris Segoyan, uh, did a, a, published a paper showing that some uh, ISPs and, and carriers, mobile carriers, actually realized that you know, the, the demands they were facing from lawful access requests became so demanding uh, that they had to streamline it in some way. Their team couldn't keep up. It was costing mm. them a lot of money. So they created a simple web interface uh, that they then gave access to uh, law enforcement to be able to use directly for a fee. And that uh, web huh. interface was used something like 8 million times in a single year. Um, I think it doesn't take a genius to realize a revenue model when you begin to see one as governments are beginning to put pressure and download controls to the <laughs> private sector, uh, already we see this in the, in the so-called big data analytics yep. market where companies are, are offering to law enforcement, uh, you know, we will be able to take all of this data mm. out there and <laughs> do mar a strategic intelligence, targeted intelligence surveillance for you. In order to get that, we need to go to the telecom carriers. Suddenly that data that at one point was like, if we keep this on our servers for six months, it's really it costs us a lot of money. Actually, no, let's save it, process it, and sell it. Uh, I mean, this is, let's face it, the revenue model of Facebook is not you know, an open internet. It's about you know, advertisement and so on. The same type of uh, revenue models are, are, uh, are being explored around uh, intelligence and national security. Okay. I don't, so I don't, I don't think that's fair, but I actually, no. but I mean, obviously, but I, I also think it's actually. What's it, not fair? It, it, I, I, <laughs> I think it actually illustrates, like, it actually illustrates a really complex problem that I think is hard, which is if you, if you, um, if you do not charge law enforcement for requests, then they have no disincentive. They have no disincentive to submitting requests. There's no yeah. cost. There's no, there's no cost to them, and so they might as well just submit as many requests as possible. Yeah. I understand exactly your point about fees, and, I'm, and I don't have necessarily a view either way. Mm -hmm. I just think it's a really hard question. Um, I, actually, yeah. I, actually, I, I actually think Chris has advocated for charging fees for precisely yeah. that reason, because right. it could create a possible all disincentive. I, all I'm saying, yeah. for sure, like, you know, companies shouldn't bear that cost, right? It's not. The, the, the he's downloading the controls of, of the mar you know the cost of, of the, the point. The point. The companies, that charge, the companies that charge fees, and there are plenty of companies that charge fees. The companies that do it aren't trying to make money. I don't. Yeah. There think. are some, though. However, there, there may be some, but they. But the purpose of fees is to dis. I mean, oh, I think the the uh, this is a typical example of a debate where <laughs> the two the two sides have one perception of a common fact. And the common fact is, I think, if we can <laughs> summarize here, is the notion that there has to be a disincentive for abuse. The question of whether it has to be done through fees or not, and if you do it through fees, it can lead to new thinking that actually has a counter effect 
that is bad is perfectly compatible. I think there's no, no if I summarize yeah, I think, it, I think my point is acceptable. just that two people I know who care a lot about human rights come down on opposite sides of that. So Ron and Chris maybe come okay. down on opposite so sides, an and I think that illustrates just how hard the questions are. I don't think okay. we come down on opposite sides. I've had long conversations with Chris about this. Okay, so <laughs> that one is going to be, it was an interesting factor eight. Uh, uh, a final round <coughs> of, of comments uh, as a conclusion. Uh, with one question basically is, moving forward, we've talked a lot about process, due process, notifications, organizing the interaction between the different actors. Are you hopeful that the discussion is maturing at the moment or that people are retrenching on the contrary in their different side and how can it be uh, promoted? Dunya, let's start in this direction. Well, I'm always hopeful <laughs> <laughs> and uh, an optimist. Uh, uh, otherwise, I, I don't think I would be able to, to uh, perform the job that I'm performing at the moment. You, you have to be hopeful and you have to engage um, and, um, you know, what, what I see is that efforts are not missing from international organizations, NGOs, companies. Um, you know, there are many um, engaging in, in this, uh, um, you know, issues, discussing it and trying to find solutions. Um, that's positive. The negative is that on the other side, there are too many governments uh, showing absolutely no political will in order mm. to, to do something. Um, again, you know, I, I, I'm not going to talk about companies and, uh, you know, the, the way they interact with the governments and uh, which kind of deals they make with certain governments because that's not part of my mandate. Uh, but um, in this era of, of uh, innovations, of uh, technological development, we do not know what the future will bring. Uh, we can guess, uh, and uh, we can only see that it will expand, and we, we do not know what is awaiting you know, around the corner. But in this process, I think it's very important not to forget that the fundamental freedoms uh, of and online and the new era will just remain the same, and we mm. need to be pushing and, and, and fighting for it, uh, not forgetting how it is important uh, you know, to preserve these rights. So that's, that's how I see it, no matter you know, how fast uh, we move, and we mm. do move fast, but these efforts should uh, continue, and I would like to see more cooperation and more coordination when it comes to these issues within the international organizations, more engagement of uh, um, industry, the companies, telecommunications, you know, telcos are very important, but also something that is quite missing in this uh, arena is uh, academia which I think should okay. be more active and more engaged in uh, on our, all our discussions about internet freedom. Okay, thank you. Eric? I mean, picking up from the, the academic point, I think again, kind of reiterating what I was saying at the beginning here, what, what we're missing is um, clarity. And what we're missing is, is the understanding that some of the laws have, the powers that they have, the reach that they have, uh, and how they're being clarity. interpreted. And so, we can't foster and encourage good academic writing on this stuff if we don't have very clear interpretations and if, if governments aren't coming forward about what laws they're using and how they're mm. using them. And we've had a few years in which I think this discussion has really got a whole lot better and, and that we're learning a lot more about the laws that are there. To move it to the next step, we need governments to stop publishing laws and saying that that's their, that's their due diligence, done. Mm. It's not because we need to understand how they interpret them. And saying that mm. it, it, is, it would harm national security to reveal the meaning of the act <laughs> is wrong. <laughs> Interesting. And so we need, we need that next push. And something that I think a role that companies can play to help us with that is to publish the kinds of requests that they get from law enforcement. It's one thing to be, gave, to be able to know what's on the books, but it's a very different thing to know what actually gets used. And I think that that's a real way that we can cooperate. And maybe that's the, the next step of the kind of transparency report for you guys. It isn't, it isn't just aggregated numbers, but saying, here's the laws <laughs> that we see. This is what gets presented to us. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's going to be the next stage that's going to allow us to, to push this into a much more sophisticated level of discussion. Thank you. My first point. Lynn, what do you think? A lot of the discussion is focused on security or protection. And I think we need to start thinking about in the context of managing risk 
we're all operating in a very complex system. Our networks are interconnected, our business practices are interconnected. Everything is interconnected. That means there's a, a shared responsibility at the same time as there's a shared risk. Um, I think we all need to get much more comfortable with living in that shared both risk and responsibility. And we need to find different structures and different processes uh, to address them. Um, and I think one of the, the key things, again, would be to move, from the, move to the perspective of managing risk, understanding that we, there is no such thing as absolute security, um, and that we want to do is prioritize and protect opportunities for economic and social innovation versus um, anything which is sort of focused on preventing any perceived harm. Yeah, not creating a, an online world that would be the perfect world. <laughs> Matt, you're here. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have much to add. I mean, I think the challenges are really great. I hope that we can work collaboratively on them. And I think, I mean, the point that Eric just raised is evidence of how when you have a robust conversation about this sort of thing with people with shared interests, you can come up with some pretty creative um, and interesting approaches. So encouraging to be optimistic, I hope. Ron. So I guess my final comment would be to get back to the, the original title of the panel, which we didn't really talk <laughs> about, was distributed security, which actually is a concept that I've been peddling around. And at the heart of that concept is the idea of mixture, division, restraint, basic principles that I think we are uh, at risk of losing sight of. And I think going further than that, uh, mm -hmm. we now have to think about how to apply these principles of checks and balances and oversight and transparency uh, to private sector actors because they do wield enormous power and influence. Uh, that's not necessarily a new thing, um, but the decisions they take can have public consequences, sometimes without public accountability and transparency. And so moving in the direction of dealing with that is, is an extraordinarily challenge, uh, challenging task. And I agree wholeheartedly with Matt that, uh, you know, combative dialogue, there's a place for it, but it really requires uh, constructive dialogue mm. and so maybe to yeah. end the panel we end on a positive note by congratulating Facebook for taking the step of joining uh, the GNI because I think this is uh, a remarkable step that we should applaud. So, so thank you to uh, all of you. It's been a, a, an active and lively uh, discussion I, I think. Thanks to, uh, to the audience for the, for the comments and I have now a, a, very, um, a very important task uh, to make. Uh, beyond closing this, uh, this panel, is that today is a particular day for uh, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> because actually it's her birthday today. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have decided to do this at the end, so that the embarrassment is just at the end, <laughs> not at the beginning. <laughs> well, I'm very happy to share <laughs> with you. That's the <laughs> shared <laughs> risk. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm exceedingly happy to be here in Stockholm <laughs> and in Sweden and sharing my birthday. Here. <laughs> Thank so you. What about a full fold in hooray for her? Like we yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, congratulations, Lynn. Hooray! 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 hooray. 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 <laughs> I feel like I just survived another year <laughs> or, or a day or something. Thank you to you all. <laughs> thank and you. Thank you. Enjoy thank the you. break. <laughs>